So what's fun about this program is everybody on staff, we all have our uh, little history crushes, we call them, you know. So, and that's the beauty of our work here is that we do a lot of original research. We find stories, people tell us about stories, or we do an oral history and learn something, and we try to incorporate it, whether into an exhibit or public programs. Uh, yesterday I did a couple programs, uh, one for uh, the, our Montana and also for the Senior Center, and uh, we really love the opportunity to share the stories in as many different ways as possible. A lot of the program I'm about to present, I think I have 50 slides, slides uh, really are focused on um, Hazel Hunkins and a lot of the Hazel Hunkins story is now told in our new traveling exhibit. We built a traveling exhibit in time for 2020 which is the 100th anniversary of the 19th amendment and so we'll have that uh, traveling pop-up banners which is in the back corner here available for folks to uh, peruse for the next five or six years. So we hope that a lot of people in Yellowstone County get a chance to uh, to hear her story. So, and I'm gonna focus primarily on her story during World War I, during the protest movement in front of the White House. Uh, this follows uh, two programs that preceded. Uh, two weeks ago, I had Ed Saunders do a program on uh, Montana nurses uh, serving in World War One, which was a fantastic program. And last week we had Ken Robeson, uh, the writer also did a program on Montanans serving in the war. I'm gonna take a different approach this time because Hazel Hunkins wasn't serving in the war. She was fighting for democracy and uh, often was attacked because of that. So uh, without further ado, uh, Hazel Hunkins, I'll give you a quick kind of overview of who she is. Her family moved here to operate Hunkins Jewelry Store on North Broadway, they came from Colorado. She went to school here in Billings and graduated from high school. The Hunkins Jewelry Store is in the Babcock block and uh, the irony is where it's the uh, Rebels and Razors store is today, which is very fitting if, as you hear her story. Uh, voted by classmates in the class of 1908 here at Billings High as the most popular, the second brightest, and the third most conceited student. So, and she attends, uh, oddly enough, she was the top of her class at Billings High, but she still had to go to prep school for a year. Uh, she went to prep school and then she attended Vassar College, which, uh, you know, years later, people would recognize that Vassar was kind of this, uh, you know, place that a lot of the, the women's movements were really circulating. So she came out of Vassar with a chemistry degree uh, and then would start teaching at the University of Missouri. So, and that, that picture actually of her, a lot of these photographs are from the Schlesinger Library, which is the Radcliffe Institute at a Harvard University. So her collections, her private collections are at the uh, London School of Economics in London and at Harvard. So this is a picture of her on North 33rd at her house here in downtown Billings. So a little about the context of the time period. We have her teaching chemistry in Missouri. At the same time, uh, Jeanette Rankin uh, you know, was really focused on the right to vote. Uh, she joins the women's suffrage movement, became a professional lobbyist for the National American Women's Suffrage Association, and obviously was instrumental in getting the right to vote here in Montana in 1914. And then with the help of her famous brother, attorney Wellington Rankin, uh, who supported and guided her campaign she was elected as the first woman to Congress in 1916. So the suffrage uh, amendment goes through in 1920. So there are several states, western states, that already had provided women with the right to vote. And um, you know, it's odd, you think sometimes the direction is either way, but obviously in the western states took the lead on this. And a lot of what was going on at the time was whether this was a state's rights issue or whether this was a federal issue. And a lot of the different protesters at the time were you know, taking different strategies to get suffrage through. Uh, just quickly, uh, Roosevelt, Hearst, Whitney, Guggenheim, Roosevelt, Vanderbilt, Pinchot, all of the big capitalist wives were all instrumental in uh, supporting the campaign of Charles Evans Hughes uh, for 1916 presidency, primarily because Hughes promised a national amendment. So you have all of these backers from the really wealthy folks of this country. People like Carrie Nation and Frances Willard were supportive of suffrage, but they were also very big leaders in the women's temperance movement. Uh, Margaret Sanger, the American birth control activist, 
uh, who started Planned Parenthood, was also supportive of suffrage, but had birth, you know, women's rights for sexuality as kind of the forefront. So each of these women, uh, you know, um, had a different strategy, but they all were a focus on several issues. People like Sojourner Truth and Ida Wells, who had uh, come out of slavery, were fighting for the rights also of African American women. Carrie Chapman Catt, also uh, the founder of the League of Women Voters, was also supportive, but like I said, they didn't have just a singular focus that you'll see when it comes to the National Women's Party that Hazel Hunkins gets involved with. So what happens is Hazel comes back to Billings in 1916 and uh, immediately starts looking for work. She has a chemistry degree, she's already taught chemistry, and she's very excited about you know, uh, using that degree. She came back to Billings to take care of her ailing mother. And so she says, you know, I'll go to the sugar factory, try to get some work there, go to another chemistry lab in town, try to get work there. And she kept hearing over and over, you're qualified, but we don't want a woman working in our labs. So she ended up getting actually um, a teaching position at Billings High School. So we have a photograph of her as a student and later, uh, eight years later, as a, as a teacher. Uh, but in the summer of 1916, Clara Louise Rowe of the National Women's Party called the Billings Gazette looking for educated young women who might be interested in the women's suffrage movement. And so, and these are quotes from Hazel Hunkins. Clara Louise Rowe visited me on my family porch on North 33rd. She talked and all her seeds of knowledge fell on fertile ground. Hazel realized I was one of millions who had been shoved aside because of my sex. What could I do to overcome the exclusion of women from the satisfying creative aspects of life? She was immediately taken aback by Clara Louise Rowe and what the National Women's Party was doing, and she became a supporter of their cause and joined the National Women's Party. Uh, she also noted while all her other childhood girlfriends and Billings were getting married to local boys, she said she looked at her girlfriend's domesticity with great disdain. So as I said, she would join the National Women's Party, the Alice led by Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, both who had experience with the suffrage movement in England. They were both American, but they had been in England and saw the more radical fringe suffrage movement in England, which actually was quite violent. Uh, they came back to America and they didn't want that. They didn't want the violent aspect, but they wanted to make noise. They wanted to be able to be in the press and they had a singular focus. Let's get that amendment passed, period. No other side trips or anything like that. Their singular focus was the right to get the vote for all women. So as a, um, so re she returns to the United States in January 1910, Alice Paul, and develops a plan for suffrage back here in the United States. She starts initially with the uh, uh, the National uh, Organization against for Women's Suffrage. Eventually, well, she'll split from that organization when they kind of consider, they consider her a little too radical because they were more interested in states' rights issues. She wanted a federal amendment, so she creates the National Women's Party in 1916. So Hazel Hunkins is right at the front of that. She's right at the beginning of the National Women's Party and Alice Paul and Lucy Burns guiding Almost immediately, Hazel Hunkins went to Colorado Springs uh, to uh, where they were uh, basically organizing the National Women's Party. This is a quote from Hazel. We were there to launch the campaign of the National Women's Party. We were on street corners, all open air. I was standing by Alice Paul. She turned to me and said, go on, go on, say something. I looked at her. She had such blue eyes. No, they were so dark, they were almost purple. One didn't disobey Alice Paul. She was such a compelling person. I got on the truck and I have no idea what I said. Later she told me I was wonderful. And so this is what Alice Paul's strategy was, to get younger, educated women involved, to be spokespeople for this national amendment. So we, and like I said, we have fantastic photographs. Um, here she's a photograph. Uh, she flew a plane, Hazel Hunkins, over a Redwood City in San Francisco distributing leaflets. This is the next month, so she's already in airplanes. She called the airplane a crate, or a crate held together with wires. 
the actual uh, aviator Silas Christofferson, who took her in this flight to distribute the literature, died in an airplane crash the next month, which is ha that the fate of a lot of the early aviators. You know, they get really famous and then a, a bad day, so. So by December of 1916, uh, she's out uh, protesting. They drop a large banner down you know, during uh, President Wilson's ad address to Congress. Uh, the uh, banner said, what will you do for women's suffrage? The flag was actually removed by a, lo a page. No one was arrested and all the other suffragists congratulated Hazel and Bessie for their, their strategy to, to get attention of the president. The president at this point was interested, in, as, uh, as many, that this was a state's rights issue, that it would slowly progress by each state. Um, so they were, you know, they were treated very well in the press at this point. Uh, and then in 1917, uh, where they would become most famous is as the Silent Sentinels. So early January of 1917, Alice Paul led a dozen women to the gates of the White House. The first people ever to picket the White House, they called themselves the Silent Silent Sentinels because they quietly carry banners asking for democracy. And you know what's so interesting is I just watched the film by, uh, about Gandhi and a lot of Gandhi's strategies are exactly what the National Women's Party was doing. Quiet, passive, but all the, there all the time. So every time President Wilson had to leave the White House, there was a group of six or eight people standing there with these banners, not saying anything, just standing there. So. Um, the press for them is very good just before the war starts. Uh, here's a couple uh, notices. Miss Hunkins was one of the first to volunteer, has been one of the most persistent servitors. She has been before the picket morning, noon, and night, almost since this form of employment became popular. Another paper stated, Hazel Hunkins, pretty, and 23 years old, a Billings, Montana, is qualified for membership in the old guard. If endurance against icy blast her ability to carry a suffrage banner, or the strength of her earnest conviction on suffrage count for anything. So they're getting front, lane, uh, front, line, uh, front page uh, news in the Washington Post, the San Francisco Examiner, uh, on and on. The New York Times actually was anti-suffrage at the time, which is fascinating. So she wasn't getting as much good press in the New York Times. So she writes, uh, you know, they're having this great experience kind of being very visible, they're getting great press in January and February of 1917. Just before the war is about to start, she writes this letter to her mother, and you can see she's becoming a little more militant. She says, I never knew what made women bitter until I came here and saw the dominion men have over women and the way they lord it over them. If they are cornered in any way, they revert to an animal and insert, insult her. If there is anything that can make me boil, it is to be told by some great, big, fat, pompous, slobby, dirty, dishonest politician that women aren't capable of voting correctly and in the same breath say with a smirk that they do anything for the ladies. And to think that he has the power to decide on this question. So I think at this point, you know, she's writing her mother. Her letters from her mother to her mother will change right after the war starts. So uh, in March of uh, 1917, uh, the, you can see the picketers on the line up there uh, during President Wilson's inaugural parade. So there was this constant presence, you know, near the White House. Uh, and Hazel Hunkins at this time is identified in the paper as the standard bearer uh, for the National Women's Party of all states where both men and women now vote. So she was, since she was from Montana, she was kind of the representative of all the states that already had the right to vote. And as I said, when the war starts on April 6, 1917, everything changes for all of these protesters in front of the White House. And I'll show you a little bit, since we've been doing kind of a series on World War I, I thought I'd provide some context of all of the different ways also that people reacted to the war. And uh, so the first one I have is a letter from the uh, Billings Gazette. Jeanette Rankin ran on the notion that she would be a congresswoman who would not support the war. President Wilson actually was not supportive of the war initially also in his campaign. She and uh, a couple dozen uh, senators would actually oppose the United States entering World War I. 
So it's interesting, you can't win, or, or you know, if you're a woman apparently at this point, because instead of the Gazette saying, you know, good, good for you, you stood up on your principle and what you ran on, the uh, Billings Gazette uh, says, uh, Jeanette Rankin ran true to the feminine form when she voted against the war resolution and lost the most brilliant opportunity that had been offered any woman in modern times. It is the hardest blow that has been struck as suffrage because the very people who argued against it have proven to them that women in critical moments do not think straight and act only under emotion and sentiment. So you know, what would they have said if she voted for the war? I have no idea. I, I suspect it could have been a slam that way. But here in Billings, there's all of these efforts, obviously, to support the war. Uh, the list is uh, quite long. These are uh, a photograph of the canteen service uh, that was at the depot that served uh, meals and coffee to all the soldiers coming through town. So, and it's amazing how much effort the communities uh, put behind the effort. I mean, this is really the first world war. And so this is, this is pretty big. Um, the, war, you know, the Billings Rotary Club would initiate what would become a national prayer movement known as the Angelus Movement. The idea, that, the idea was that every day at a certain time, everybody would take a minute to pray and to ponder and to think about the soldiers, uh, all in the task of winning the war. So every day at 11 a.m. there would be a moment of silence and prayer to remember the sacrifices of all the Allied troops. So it started here in Billings Rotary and it became a national movement that at 11 o'clock in the morning, people would take a second in support of the troops. Um, the aggressive patriotism, which often arises during these periods, uh, shows up here in Montana in particular. Uh, this is the Elstone County Sheriff's Proclamation from the, I think, a, just a week or so after the war had started, our, our participation. And it says, every citizen owes the undivided allegiance to the American flag. Any act, however slight, tending to give aid or comfort to the enemy is treason. The Billings Gazette editorials read, some time ago, the journal of the Billings Evening advised aggressive patriotism as a commendable thing. The journal amends that now. Aggressive patriotism is not only commendable, but it is necessary to the welfare of any person in Billings or anywhere else in America. And the groups like the Legal Council of Defense and the Third Degree Committee would begin a systematic, uh, they were, it was even said in the paper, they were given virtually unlimited authority for looking at alleged cases of food hoarding, wartime violations, slacker, or anybody who was pro-German. And out of that movement, we have things like here in Billings, where our alderman was forced to resign. Uh, Curtis Omi, who had been the Grand Marshal of the 1914 July 4th Parade in Billings, was accused less than what? three years later of being not American enough. And so, and unfortunately, they found out later it was his wife who had turned him in, and they were in the process of a bad divorce. So fortunately, he did not go to prison like some people did, uh, but there were people who were in prison because they said they either didn't care about the war uh, or said something when they were drunk in a bar in Red Lodge and they were thrown in jail, some for up to three years. Um, you know, oddly enough, here in Billings, we have this group called the Billings Liberal Club, who I don't think was pronouncing their uh, mindset at the time of the war, because you can see this kind of aggressive patriotism is in play. Uh, but they wrote a paper called War and the Failure of Religion, uh, which they were basically arguing that the world war was so confusing to them because it was Christian nations who were fighting Christian nations. So you have all of these different kind of sentiments that are going on. The two cards are actually of uh, German soldier cards uh, during the war. And then uh, back to suffrage. Even the, some of the major players in suffrage, like Carrie Chapman Catt, who I mentioned, who had served as the president of the National American Women Suffrage Association and founder of the League of Women Voters, asked to remove the suffrage pickets from the White House. 
She said this effort should show only 100% support for the war effort to shift the public's perception in favor of the suffragists who were now and should be perceived as patriotic and not as patriotic. So a lot of the suffrage groups came out against the National Women's Party and people like Alice Paul and Hazel Hunkins. The New York State Women's Suffrage Association used the war as a medium through which they could publicly denounce the White House pro protests, claiming that they tend to harass government in this time of great stress. So like I said, the, the sentiment uh, really went against these women, and which is often the case during wartime. If you speak out against a particular war effort or something like that, you have this incredible wide spectrum of people's feelings coming, laying right there for everybody to see. So here we are in June of 1917, you know, we're three months into the war. Uh, women's, uh, women led mobs begin attacking the pickets at the White House gates. And I like this particular photo. You can see this woman right here scolding these ladies with her, you know, finger kind of waving in their face. This is it right here. Uh, so 2,000 anti-protesters come in. Hazel Hunkins said, one minute I was standing there in perfect peace and quiet, holding a banner. Three minutes later, I was holding a broken staff with no banner at the center of a surging crowd. Well, anyway, Mom, it was an experience, and I never want to go through it again, and I can't even read accounts of it. She's writing her mother here. She said, explaining to what her mother what happened at the protest, because now she's in national press, really for the wrong reasons. So now her mother and her stepbrother are here in Billings reading this type of stuff. She explains to her mother, Mrs. Richard, Richard, Mrs. Richardson, who's actually a suffragist, came up to me and said I ought to be ashamed of myself to stand there and hold that banner, a banner that read, we demand democracy and self-government in our own land. She came back and took hold of my banner and spit on it, and my heart sank. It was the first time I had seen such venom, and I could only meet it by absolutely ignoring it and saying nothing. And this is the habit I'm starting to learn. When in doubt, do nothing. And it, it has a, a little ring of Gandhi there, you know, that kind of passive resistance. You just let it happen, you know, and, and really one of the key things in the National Women's Party movement is the idea of getting press. They understood that if you had your face and picture in the news, people might pay attention to your cause. Now, obviously before the war, it was, oh, this is so sweet, you know, these young girls are out there. Now they're being looked at completely different. So, uh, oh, sorry about that. So one woman on the streets while watching the protesters said, it is shocking to think that such thin-blooded, narrow-minded women should have ever been born. These women are living in the best country in the world, enjoying all the wonderful privileges the freedom of republic offers, and they don't even seem to know it. Another woman said they are vicious, contemptible in the sight of God and man, pig-headed, brainless, and heartless. Uh, the Montana papers got involved with this uh, also, the Helena Independent. The Campbell, who was the editor of the Helena Independent, was the leader of the, suffer or the sedition movement here in Montana. He said, Hazel is simply one of the misguided friends of the suffrage cause. She is part of the lunatic fringe, which hangs forever around the edge of the suffrage cause. Little Miss Hazel Hunkins of Montana has been misled. It is the duty of Congresswoman Jeanette Rankin to hunt up the little Vassar graduate and pin a tag to her so she will not get lost on the long journey back to Montana. If Hazel is naughty when she gets out here in the sunshine where straight thinking is the rule, her mother should take her out behind the woodshed and let the neighbors hear the gentle patter of the, her slipper on the bustle of Hazel's overalls. And then the editor put, we guess that suffragists wear overalls. So. And as I said, the protest continues on. Now there's this danger because you have all of these protesters who are coming against the protesters. You have people who are yelling out treason and traitor and threatening their, their lives, in some instances, throwing eggs at them, you know. Um, um, and so one of the things that happens is Representative Howard of Georgia introduces a bill designed to prevent the suffragists or anyone 
from displaying banners in the vicinity of the White House or any other public buildings. That doesn't go through. The Capitol Police begin cracking down on these the silent sentinels, first under the guise that they were protecting them. So they would arrest them for their protection because with all of these people you know, spitting at them or, or taking away their banners, the police felt, well, this will be for their own good. Um, so as I said, the uh, first, first intent was of protecting the protesters qu pretty quickly because they kept going back. Every time they got arrested, they would show up the next day with another banner or they would replace the banner that was stolen or destroyed with other ones. So they kept coming back. So then the police started arresting the silent sentinels in front of the White House for obstruction of a public sidewalk. Uh, and Hazel has said that's almost comical because the sidewalk in front of the White House was about 25 feet wide and there was only like 12 women in a straight line. But because there were all of these other people who were, you know, not always, uh, you know, yelling at them. There were some people who were obviously supportive, but they've said this was causing an obstruction. And, you know, uh, so you see some other newspaper articles from Montana. Uh, Montana women do not lend approval. This is the executive committee uh, here in Billings uh, basically saying she's not with us. The uh, Red Cross up in Helena says Hazel Hunkins isn't with us, so a lot of the press comes out against her. The Women's Club of Billings stated that they did not approve of the display of banners in front of the White House and that it was in no sense the sentiment of this community, especially in a time of war. A Billings girl was one of the seemingly star performers in parading these banners. This should not be construed as, construed as expressive of sentiment in Billings on the subject of women's suffrage. These sentiments expressed on the banners are improper at a time when the nation is at war. Oddly enough, Hazel Hunkin would respond to a lot of these headlines and say, you know, it's not what happened. You know, when she had the Red Cross and she was supposed to be, uh, you know, pissing them off, she actually found it was a very congenial atmosphere. They, made, they disagreed in a very civil way, but the newspaper would often pick up the story and kind of exaggerate it in the headlines. So, and like I said, there was some support on the streets. And um, she says, the, this is her talking to her mother about this experience, but she did say, a man came down the picket line the other day and said to me, I brought my little boy especially to see you girls. I wanted him to see history in the making. I have watched, she says, I have watched public opinion change in such a short time that I wouldn't be surprised to be greeted as a hero rather than a offender sooner or later. So she writes to her mother at this time. She says, I am sorry for the thing I've done. We have been attacked and depressed, but every minute has been darkened by the thought of what you were suffering in Billings. I know how you hate publicity, and I also know how, you, how little you know of the dirty game the press is going right now. The news is twisted and contorted to suit the policy or views of the editor. You must take the attitude that more than half of what you read is false, and the other half is contaminated with the writer's own point of view. Or own point of view. I can imagine you walking uptown and feeling that every eye in Billings is on you as the mother of a notorious character. If friends ask about it, I would treat it as a good joke, that, and that you didn't relish any of it very seriously. I've watched public opinion change in short times, that it will change again. So what's interesting is though how prevalent the Hunkins jewelry store is advertising at this point, which makes perfect sense. If your daughter's in the news uh, in what she was doing, the Hunkins jewelry store was advertising, obviously, on behalf of the war effort, whether it was for selling war bonds and things like that. So one of the questions I had initially uh, that we're learning that there's more and more evidence of the discussions of her in Montana was why don't we know her story? Why, why is she on the headlines of the Billings Suzette? When she's reaching headlines in the Naples, Florida you know, paper and the San Francisco Examiner, why, why don't we know about her story? And so this is one example this is the story, um, this is in a July 20, 1917 Gazette. It is on like page seven, and the story is right here. 
So it's completely buried in the newspaper. And this is what the article said. It said basically she was an innocent girl, an innocent victim. It almost made it like she was walking by and she was arrested. You know, so they're kind of downplaying uh, her actual role. But the article is fantastic because they do print a lot of her thinking and why they're doing this during the wartime. She, when asked why she and other suffragists were making laughing stocks of themselves, Ms. Hunkin said, we are taking advantage of the war situation to point out that if this war is for democracy, if we are to send our soldiers 3,000 miles into the trenches of a foreign land to fight for democracy, it would not be amiss to have democracy extended at home. Asked if the picketing will go on, she said yes, even though it means arrest, we will go on picketing because we know we are within our legal rights in this country. In addition, she said, when our women are in jail, nearly all of them employ their time knitting and making articles for the Red Cross and for our soldiers. So, and there's a series of arrests throughout the summer and fall of 1917 of these women. Uh, um, one of the most famous events is the, uh, the Night of Terror in November of 1917. What happened, it's just like you see in later protest movements. They're charged with a, a felony or they're charged with a crime and you go in front of the judge and the judge says, okay, $2 fine. And none of the women would pay it. They wanted the press, they wanted to make a stand. They're like, we're not gonna, we're not just gonna pay. And actually, if you look at other movements later on with Martin Luther King and Gandhi, they would do the same type of thing. They would refuse to pay the fines, they would go to jail. Initially, a lot of the uh, suffragists from the National Women's Party would spend a night, then two nights. And then you can see already by late fall, Alice Paul faces six months in jail uh, for obstructing a public sidewalk. And so they were thrown in prison at the Oconquin prison in Virginia, um, and they were treated very badly. They, they claimed that they were political prisoners, but they were put in with the, you know, regular prisoners, and, uh, and they were treated very poorly. There was a night where um, the guards uh, abused and knocked the women around, which is known as the Night of Terror. Hazel Hunkins was arrested, but she was released before the Night of Terror. And uh, as part of that treatment, um, the treatment became national news, how the women were being treated, and that's exactly Alice Paul's strategy. For weeks, the women's only water came from an open pail. Their food, a colorless slop, was infested with worms. The blankets were washed once a year. Rose Winslow and Alice Paul began a hunger strike in early November, um, and they all started hunger strikes at this point. And so what happened is that of course, they didn't want her to die. Alice Paul was ready to die for this cause. She believed in it so well. So they would force feed the women who were on the hunger strikes by putting tubes down their throats and feeding them. Of course, that gets out. And in some ways, again, as part of their strategy, they moved Alice Paul to solitary confinement in the prison's psychopathic ward. And with growing news of the terrible treatment, they soon released Hunkins and prison's friends all before Thanksgiving and before Congress convened again on December 3rd. Um, public opinion began to sway because of their actions, you know, because they were going to just lay it out on the line in this cause. So. And as I said, the protests continued through 1917, through 1918. Oh, the attending doctor at the uh, jail said, uh, that courage in women is often mistaken for insanity. So that's what he said about Alice Paul at the time. So, you know, her experience, um, you know, here, here they are in 1918, uh, kind of, again, protesting. There's uh, Hazel Hungan's carrying the American flag toward Lafayette Square. So, oddly enough, through even all the hunger strikes, through the jails, they continue to go out, these several dozen women, and protest in front of the White House as the silent sentinels. So this is a letter from uh, Hazel Hunkins, or this is a diary, I'm sorry, a diary excerpt from Hazel Hunkins, talking kind of about her experience and her relationship with home here in Billings. She said, my summer vacations from 1916 to 1920 were spent with my mother and half-brother in Billings, who, when I settled into the company of the young women and men with whom I had grown up, a gulf appeared between us. 
Each summer, it became more apparent. I complained to my mother, I just can't get interested in Jimmy, the manager of the telephone company, as he can't talk about anything but love and business, or the owner of the milling company, no matter how rich he is. And my first childhood love, whom I shall remember with great affection, thought of his father's real estate business on weekdays and fishing on the weekends. In a way, I love them all, but as for marrying any of them, I would rather go to prison. Which she does again. So she continually, uh, like I said, this process of arrest, uh, at least of five different arrests and thrown into prison. Again, refusing to uh, pay fines. In one of the struggles, uh, she was knocked over. Uh, her banner was taken out. And also, she sprained her wrist. So they were physically getting hurt. In uh, 1918 at Lafayette Park, they uh, were burning the speeches of President Wilson, who still had not turned from kind of being a states' rights issue to a federal. Uh, they started a watch fire and they would burn President Wilson's uh, speeches. You can imagine this is going well with people in Congress and the president at the time. One of the uh, suffragists who was fighting alongside Hazel Hunkins said, our group was militant, but we never ever sanctioned violence. It was abhorrent to Alice Paul. Ours was peaceful picketing. Although violence was often put upon us, we were clubbed by the police, had our clothing torn, had our banners ripped from the poles. I remember when I was speaking at Lafayette Square being pelted with eggs and my coat was dripping when I was finished. So de they were denied their demand to be treated as political prisoners. Uh, again, they refused to pay fines, they were sent to jail. Um, and I don't remember what the sentencing was, if it was for like a couple months, but 24 women then, including Hazel Hunkins, began hunger strikes. And this is in 1918. They were released a few days later. The suffragists reported that Mrs. Lewis, Gertrude Crocker, Catherine Fisher, Hazel Hunkins, and Julia Emery, all of whom were among the most severely ill, they were actually there for five, five days uh, on their hunger strike. Uh, the, all of whom were among the most severely ill, left their prison hardly able to walk from the taxi to the door of the headquarters. Fellow suffragist Inus Haynes Irwin reported, as fast as the women were arrested, their state senators and representatives were now being besieged by letters and telegrams from home, urging them to go and see these imprisoned constituents. So their broad base is actually growing at this point, but it's but, you know through these arrests. And her confidence, you know, you, you saw the letter earlier from her mother complaining about how horrible this is. She sends her mother a telegram that says, 26 of America's finest women have accompanied me to jail. It's splendid. Don't worry. Love, Hazel. And again, the... Uh, the uh, the newspapers came out with different stories. This has never been proven, but there's a story of her cussing at the American flag, which made national headlines, which she denied vehemently ever actually doing. And this is another uh, uh, piece from the uh, Helena Independent. Again, like I said, the kind of leader of the uh, Defense Council and the Sedition Act in Montana. Um, he responded, uh, Will Campbell, the uh, editor, uh, responded with his usual candor. If the height of bliss lies in getting newspaper advertising, Hazel Hunkadora, Hunkins of Billings, ought to be satisfied. Of course, old-fashioned mothers and women generally who are fighting to win the war may not like what Hazel is alleged to have said in order to obtain more publicity, but that is beside the point. The point is that Hazel has landed her pretty tootsie wootsies slap in the middle of every daily newspaper in the United States. Um, so again, the Helena paper was, as a historian, we love the Helena paper because it was so like, wow, you can get incredible stuff about the uh, Sedition Act, but you can also get this kind of other end spectrum of uh, the press kind of falling, uh, not falling for Hazel Hunkins. So a few days later after this, the war ends on November 11, 1918. The National Women's Party's efforts, though, continue. As they're not going to be satisfied until that vote gets through. 
Um, so on January 1st, 1919, the women began another series of watch fire demonstrations. The bronze urn at Lafayette Park, this is from a suffragist. Hazel Hunkins, clinging to a high pedestal urn, was holding aloft the suffrage tricolors. The flames played over her slender figure of the girl and glowed through the purple, white, and gold. People said it was that instant's picture, that moment. Policemen immediately rushed over, followed by a large crowd, and they arrested Alice Paul, Julia Emery, and Hazel Hunkins. In the meantime, in front of the White House had been built another watch fire, and Hazel Hunkins is pictured here in 1919 uh, on, the, uh, what, on the publication for the National Women's Party. The Senate and Wilson, after the war, and with this, I would argue, with the presence of these women every day, is reminded this is worthy. This is an amendment that should be passed. The Senate finally passed the suffrage amendment uh, about seven months later on June 4th, 1919. This began a fierce 14-month campaign for ratification by three quarters of the states. And on August 18, 1920, Tennessee became the 30th, 36th state to ratify the amendment. The 19th Amendment simply states, the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States on any state or account of sex. Uh, it became part of the U.S. Constitution eight days later, so that's one of the reasons we have this traveling exhibit. Next year is the 100th anniversary of the ratification, and we hope that this story about this local uh, Montana girl uh, could be heard. This bill was actually uh, modeled after a similar bill that had been represented by uh, Representative Rankin uh, in a work session the year before. And the other thing is Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton had drafted the original text for the 19th Amendment in 1878. So it took 42 years of protest. And one of the reasons that Hazel Hunkin said they continue to protest during the war is because the wars previously when suffragists had put down their banners had no impact. The Spanish-American War, it just passed by and they were right where they were at the beginning. So they just felt, let's just go plow into this, let's get this done. Uh, like I said, it took 42 years to uh, pass its final hurdle of obtaining three-fourths of the, you know, the Senate. So the organizers of the National Women's Party, which focused exclusively on getting the National Amendment, had, as one paper said, worked hard in order to work themselves out of jobs. Uh, and Hazel and her husband, uh, Charles Hallen, and a journalist, would live and raise a family in England. Hazel continued as a journalist working for the State Department as a leader of the Six Point Group, which was a feminist organization in London. This is just a picture of her in London as the chairman, the only American-born chairman of the uh, Six Point Group. And then she came back to the United States in the 1970s uh, for the Equal Rights Amendment fight, which was in 1977. And a headline in the paper called her at 87, a hellraiser at 87. So I love giving this presentation like at Highgate and uh, Mission Ridge Senior Center, you know, because you hear this story about this like girl who's in her 20s who's doing these crazy things. And then yet yeah, in the 70s, there she is again at age 87, still on the front line, still marching, protesting for the Equal Rights Amendment. The tiny spirited symbol of the women's movement, it was, this is from the Salt Lake Tribune, more than a half a century ago, it was Hazel Hunkins who set a fire on the White House lawn in the battle for women's suffrage. I don't think this is true, but this is what she said. You could do the same thing today. The 87-year-old fighter for equal rights advised a new generation of feminists on Tuesday, August 24th, 1977. Um, I don't think I would advise anyone to run out into the White House lawn and start a fire. So, um, And then the last piece of this story, an amazing story, is that here's a woman who lived really around the world uh, fighting for women's rights, but at the end of her life she wrote to her friend, uh, Helene O'Donnell, I was always grateful for your kindnesses when I came back to Billings to rebury my mother's ashes and those of my husband, Charles. Charles had no connection with Billings, but a long time before his death, I asked him where he wanted to be buried, and he answered without a moment's delay, I want to be wherever you are. And long before that, I had decided I wanted to live in the forever in Billings, Montana. So someday you and I will be near somewhere, near together in that faraway land.
And, and what's fun about this is that, you know, uh, all of us on staff have done these walking tours at the cemetery, and I don't know if we all do this, but we all stand on Charles' grave when we're telling the story of Hazel Hunkins, because Charles Hallinan's grave is at her feet. And of course his grave says, husband of Hazel. So he died first, so she had one little jab, I think, you know, so. Um, and as I said, you know, the, the fight, the right to vote for women, I mean, goes yeah, all the way back to Abigail Adams, you know, uh, and her feminist thinking, you know, into the 1840s, you know, and uh, the great leaders of that period, 1878 with the 19th Amendment being written, 42 years later, the, the 19th Amendment is passed in 1920, and uh, here we are 100 years later, so. And like I said, if you have a chance, uh, the exhibit, which you'll see a lot of what I've just talked about, is here. And uh, if you know of any venues uh, that you think would be great to have this uh, traveling exhibit, let me know, because we're really open to uh, having this become part of the characters that we talk about. Um, I love the Chamber of Commerce. We work with the Chamber all the time. And I feel like we have parallel missions in some ways. We're the past to the present. They're the present to the future. Um, but they'll call and they'll say, hey, you know, we need something for our, you know, Southeast Montana Tourism Guidebook. And I'll be like, oh my God, we have these fantastic stories about Hazel Hunkins, the, the suffragists, or Ethel Hayes, the syndicated cartoonist. And they're like, no, no, we want like Buffalo Bill or Calamity Jane. I'm like, really? So, you know, my hope is that as these stories are told and people learn stories from, about Hazel Hunkins, Helen Ann, and also Ethel Hayes, that it becomes part of how we talk about our community. That's, that's the best hope I have for this. So, uh, anyway, th thanks again to Northwest Energy for helping support this program. We're, we have a wonderful partnership with Community 7 Television that records these. The, all of the presentations we do are on Vimeo now. Uh, so you just go to Community 7's website, go to the Vimeo icon, click, and you'll see about 40 of our programs. So, uh, thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions? It's about eight minutes to one. Yes? Where did they get the financing for this? Because they weren't employed. Because were they getting money sent from their families? Or the question is, where did they get the financing? They did have people backing them up. So you could see, like I mentioned, the, the Hearst and the Randolphs and stuff. Those, those women, all of those high-end civic uh, women, uh, obviously the most powerfully rich in America, were interested in the 19th Amendment. So they did have support from them. And Hazel also worked. She didn't just protest. She worked for the State Department at times. So she would toggle between like working at a job in DC or doing some journalism and then going out in the, the, the front lines. So, but she also did travel. She was out in Salt Lake City for the National Women's Party. She traveled through Montana. So that's when you see those articles about the Red Cross opposing her. It's because she showed up here in the state on behalf of the National Women's Party. So they did have some financial support. Yes? Oh, the Six Point Group? The, yeah. the question is, what is the Six Point Group? That's basically a feminist organization that was uh, in London, England, uh, that's developed right in right at the time that she shows up in London, uh, right in 1920-21, the Six Point Group is just taking off. So she's associated with that organization. Their focus was on equal rights for pay, for women teachers, for social workers, uh, to, you know, things like uh, they were fighting for the uh, benefits for widows, they were fighting for the benefits of single mothers. Uh, you know, sometimes the men would get the children. They were fighting for equal, uh, you know, ac not access to their children after a divorce, things like that. So that organization's focus sweeps right into the 1960s and 1970s. So good. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.